Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So today we're going to finish up exploring the AVX512 instruction set and we're just going to be taking a bit of a deep dive and looking at the mechanisms of AVX512. Okay, so this is really only practical for very low level programmers. I understand this won't be useful information to a lot of people, but I hope it's interesting anyway. All right, let's get started. Okay, so we're just uh, at the same position that we were uh, last time in the code. So what I might do is just quickly show how to detect AVX 512 features. In the first video in this series, we actually went through each of the different smaller instruction sets and I mentioned a CPU ID flag. So the way that you use that, uh, if we just have a bit of a demonstration, uh, I'll make a little function just here called um, AVX foundation detection, for example. Yeah, so this little function will detect if the CPU that's running the code is capable of the AVX foundation instruction set. Okay, so we're going to call the CPU ID instruction and the CPU ID instruction is used just to report information on the hardware. We've got to set the function call or the, or the type of information that we're after in EAX. So we might mov EAX7 and mov ECX0. So there's a lot of different types of information that your CPU will report with a CPU ID and we specify what information we want by setting up EAX and ECX. Uh, if you want more information on CPU ID itself and all of the different features and information that it actually gives you, uh, then you'll have to look at the Intel or AMD manuals. To detect the uh, AVX foundation features, uh, we want to set EAX to 7 and ECX to 0. And then the feature will be returned as bit number 16 of EBX. So if EBX bit number 16 is 1, after this call to CPU ID, then it means this hardware is capable of AVX foundations. So what we might do is uh, shift EBX 16 uh, and EBX 1 and then mov EAX EBX. We'll just shift that little bit to the zeroth position of EBX, then we'll return that result in EAX. Uh, now there is a little thing that we have to be careful of just here. So uh, EBX is not scratch uh, in the calling convention. So we have to make sure that we save the caller's EBX and restore it. So what we should do first of all is uh, push EBX or RBX. And then just before we return, we want to pop RBX and I'll just hit save. And if I just copy this function here over to my C++ and we make a little um, declaration. Okay, so this uh, function just here should return true if my CPU is AVX foundation or AVX 512 foundation capable. So S uh, if uh, AVX foundation, that thing, STD, C out, U is capable, capable, all right of AVX512 foundation instruction set. STD endl, else STD cout, nope, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so if we detect the foundations using CPU ID, should get a true there, otherwise we'll get a false. Yeah, there you go, this CPU is capable of ZVX. Well, I didn't write this very neatly, but you get the point. EBX16 after CPU ID with function number seven and ECX set to zero will give you the uh, foundations. And all of the other instruction sets can be checked in a similar way. They're just uh, different bits of different registers. Let's move on now to have a bit of a discussion about uh, the instruction set itself, the mighty AVX512. And let's start by talking about the obvious, the massive register file increase. So we've got just here AVX 512 test. I might just use that function. So if we just hit a breakpoint right there and I come back down here and I restore this. This is code that we wrote in the last video. It's not really useful or anything. It just adds uh, two vectors together. But if I put a breakpoint right there in my assembly code and we hit run, we can actually bring up the registers window and have a look at this. Okay, so my program has broken. Not literally. If we want to look at the hardware registers, so these are little um, pieces of, uh, of memory or variables on the CPU die itself. If you want to have a look at the registers, then you go up into debug and windows and down here to registers. You can only click uh, that 
if you've broken at a break point. What you'll see here is all of the uh, general purpose registers probably. We've got RAX and his mate RBX, R15 down here, a bit of a stack point of business and some base pointer. You probably won't see the AVX 512 registers by default. But if you right click down here, you should see there's a bunch of options, SSE, AVX and AVX 512. Okay, so we'll just click that and there you should see the uh, the listing of the AVX 512 registers. There they are there. So this uh, top line just here is ZMM0. This is the 512 bit register ZMM0. Uh, ZMM1, ZMM2, all the way down to ZMM31. The original AVX registers were half the size, so 256 bits versus 512. But not only that, there was half as many of them. So uh, the AVX registers only go from YMM0 to YMM15. And with AVX 512, we actually get uh, 32 of them. Okay, it's always important to know that these things are aliased together. So the SSE register XMM0 is actually the low half of YMM0. And the AVX register YMM0 is actually the low half of ZMM0. In AVX 512, you do actually get uh, 32 YMM registers as well, and 32 XMM registers too. So a lot of these instructions uh, will work with ZMM registers, YMM registers, or uh, X MM registers too. The CPU itself actually has a gigantic register file. It's much larger than what's exposed to us uh, programmers. And it uses register renaming quite extensively to, to run our code. Uh, but I think there's something like 160 vector registers in the actual CPU. We only get access to um, 32 of them. Yeah, but it, it's often it's worth, it's worth realizing that this uh, ZMM0 just here doesn't mean an actual register on the CPU. Okay, but what you'll notice about the um, registers window is that it's nowhere near as convenient as these watch windows. So when we set a watch, you just right click down here and go add a watch. You can set a watch to a register if you want, it's perfectly fine. And the same with uh, a VCL vector. You can set a watch on that, and you can also set watches on the intrinsic data types too. The watch window doesn't specify a particular data type because these things are all unions. I mean, the data that your vector register stores uh, can be read in so many different ways. I mean, the CPU doesn't care what you're doing. Depending on what your data is, um, you tend to expand and uh, look at one of these particular branches just here. So this would be the short integers just here. Okay, so that would be how you look at the different data in your vector registers. Now I wanna talk about K masks. So this is, I think, an absolutely marvelous idea. This sort of brings it uh, very close to the way that GPUs work with predicates. AVX 512 actually introduces uh, a really flexible and simple way to achieve a lot of uh, different branchless programming techniques. And it does so with K masks. So, there's another eight registers. If we just hit play for a second and we have another look at our little register window. I'll just scroll all the way down to the bottom. Okay, so AVX 512 introduces another eight registers called K0 all the way to K7. Each register is 64 bits wide and we're not supposed to use K0. Yeah, so in your code, just use K1 through to K7. Uh, K0 is, I believe, used internally for when there's no mask used in the instruction. Yeah, I think K0 is set to all ones. Uh, what I've noticed is even if you do try and change K0, it doesn't tend to make a difference. Yeah, so at any rate, uh, try not to use K0 in your code. To use a K mask, you set it up with some pattern of ones and zeros. So for example, we might set it up with um, five five in hex, which is just one oh one oh one oh one oh. So if we go uh, mov ex five five h, Actually, I might just write it in binary. 01010101. Now, I'll just write it in binary. That's easier. If we want to move that value into a K mask, then we can't move it directly. We can't just um, move 010101 into a K mask. But what we can do is go K mov and then B because it's a byte. The K mask would be K1. EAX. So K mov B will move a byte from EAX into the K mask K1. Uh, you've also got K mov D for moving D words. Um, yeah, there's a couple of different moves just here, but we've just moved this byte 01010101 into K1 
And then if we want to use the mask, we can use it in this instruction down here, this AVX 512 instruction. And we've got to put a decoration. They call it a decoration. What this mask means is wherever there's a one in the mask, then the corresponding result should be written to the destination. So this is the destination just here. And wherever there's a zero in the K mask, say just here, then the corresponding result in the destination should not be changed. Yeah, so what you'll end up with, with this particular mask just here, we should get every second element will be the addition of these uh, two vectors, uh, but then the other in between elements won't be changed because there's a zero just there. Um, okay, so if we just step down to that line just there and we have a bit of a look at K1, uh, K1 has the value 85, which must be absolutely marvelous for it. Uh, that must be the decimal or that little bit pattern just there. ZMM0 has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in it. ZMM1 has a bunch of 5s in it. Okay, so what we're saying just here is uh, because this first bit of the K mask is a 1, it means that the 1 just here, the first element of ZMM0, should be added to the 5 just here to give a 6. But because this second uh, element or the second uh, bit of the K mask is a 0, it means that we don't want to update this second element just here. So the 2 of the destination should remain unchanged. There you go 6, 2, 8, 4, 10, 6, 12, 8. So because of the K mask, uh, we've actually only updated half of the values. Yeah, so you use a K mask to set up some bit pattern and what you're indicating there is which bits should be uh, written to. So if we set up another bit pattern, maybe something like, something like that, run. So now we should get the low four elements being added, but the upper four should be unchanged. Yeah, there you go. So the 1, 2, 3 and 4 all had 5 added to them, but the 5, 6, 7, 8 remain unchanged because the corresponding bits in the K mask were 0. Some of the instructions that previously didn't require a data type size, uh, such as your uh, P, XOR, that sort of thing, they now require a data type size because if we're to use these K masks with them, then the K masks have to know the element size. If you're dealing with K masks with doubles like we are here, then you've only got to specify the low eight bits of the K mask since there's only eight doubles. But as you can probably imagine, by the time you get up to working with um, characters or unsigned characters, there are 64 results being computed at once. So the K mask bits, um, you might use the entire um, register. Anyway, that is uh, masking with the amazing K masks. I mean, these things are just extraordinarily flexible, but we're about to get more flexible. Let me tell you, if we add a Z decoration, uh, if we add a Z decoration and we change this back to what it was, what was it? 0101001B. The Z is used in conjunction with a K mask and what it means is zero any of the elements where there's a zero in the K mask. So if we just hit stop, what we should see here is um, every second element will be zeroed. Six, zero, eight, zero, ten, zero, twelve, zero. Yeah, simple as that, really. Yeah, so instead of leaving those uh, elements unchanged, as did uh, the K mask by itself, when we use the zero decoration, they're actually zeroed. Branchless programming to the max. Okay, but the fun doesn't stop there. We've also got automatic broadcasting. I tell you what, this is actually the craziest instruction set I think I've ever seen. So let's go up here to our data segment and we'll make a, I'll call it my double since we're using doubles here. It's a real eight. It's a real seven, this one. <laughs> let's just set it to 7.0. We're gonna have a look at broadcasting. So we need a scalar. I've just defined a scalar double called my double. It's a real eight. In other words, a double precision floating point number and I've set it to seven. So what we might do, instead of adding this vector just here, full of fives to this one, what we'll do is we'll add sevens. So to broadcast is to copy one value to all elements of a vector. If we wanted to broadcast the number, say four to the C vector, then what it means is that all of the elements of the C vector would be set to four. Normally, if you wanted to add this uh, my double or these sevens to the vector, uh, this one just here, normally you would have to broadcast it and then add 
but AVX512 offers an automatic way to broadcast and let's just have a bit of a look at how to do that. So uh, I might just L-E-A-R-R-A-X. What is it? It's going to be Real 8 uh, BCST or something like that. No, I, I, th I, think, I think that's right. Let's see. We read uh, the A vector into ZMM0, just the same as before. Let me get rid of some of these watches just so that we can see what we're doing and save the watch window, why don't you? My left hand is on auto save. Control S it goes <laughs> on the watch window. All right, we've got vector A in um, ZMM0. Then we LEA my double. So LEA just means uh, load the effective address or it means RAX at that point is a pointer to my double. Then we've got the next line. So let's see what happens, zero. Uh, okay, so we better also get rid of these little masks just here since we're not really doing our masking demonstration anymore. Uh, okay, so we've stepped over the first two lines. What do we got here in uh, ZMM1? Well, ZMM1 just read the uh, a array, so it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, RAX has the address of my double, or it's a pointer to my double in other words. And the interesting part is this uh, real eight BCST or broadcast. This is the Masson or Microsoft macro assembler syntax. Uh, NASM and the Intel syntax are slightly different. I think it's something like um, one to 16 or uh, one to eight. Yeah, other uh, assemblers will use a different syntax, like this decoration just here, one to eight. But anyway, we're in we're in Massim at the moment, so BCST is the syntax. If we just hit run, or step over that line, uh, there we go. So what you'll see is that seven was added to every element of that uh, A array. Yeah, so we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight before, and now we've got eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So the interesting thing about that is that we didn't uh, use a separate register. We didn't read the seven in and then broadcast it to a register. We used uh, automatic broadcasting, which is a part of AVX 512. So this is how you do it right here. Yeah, so it's really, really convenient because I tell you what, this is common. Uh, it's very, very common that you want to do some operation with uh, some single scalar value and then you have to broadcast it and then you have to use an entire register to store the broadcast value. Uh, this is an interesting idea and, uh, and I like it a lot. This is uh, AVX 512's automatic broadcasting. Uh, it's not available for all data types. Yeah, so you won't be able to broadcast, say, a byte like this. Yeah, but still, interesting idea, really interesting idea. Automatic broadcasting, good stuff. Let's talk about another interesting feature of AVX 512, and that is uh, rounding, rounding control. Okay, that is rounding control. So if we've got a bunch of uh, doubles, or we'll make them floats, we'll make them floats. Uh, okay, so I've got a whole bunch of floats set up just there. 1.5, 2.7, negative 2.7, etc., etc. They're just a bunch of floats, but Let's not hold that against them. Let's instead read them into a register. So VMOV UPD, although I think they're aligned uh, to 16 bytes, mind you, probably not 64. Uh, get on with it. Okay, so I'll just read those into a register. Then uh, what we might do is uh, convert them to integers. Yeah, so this is a cast, in other words, a cast. So V uh, CVT, what's it gonna be like? Uh, PS to DQ. Uh, ZMM1, ZMM0, something like that. Uh, what you can do in AVX 512, you can specify the rounding on a per instruction basis. The CPU actually has four rounding modes and you normally you would set that, uh, the current rounding mode in another, in another register which is called a MXCSR. Uh, but in AVX 512, we can actually specify the rounding mode per instruction. This rounding mode will influence both what happens when you cast to and from floating point values and integers, but it also affects the rounding of the trailing bits of the floating point instructions themselves. So really, really interesting idea, but this is how you do it. So we could go uh, RN, SAE. Uh, SAE means uh, suppress all exceptions. We want them to be suppressed. Don't let those exceptions out, suppress them. All right, sorry, I wrote the wrong register types there. Who spied that? Who spied? 10 points if you did. And 11 if you uh, didn't comment. <laughs> okay, CVTPS2DQ. 
is um, convert packed singles to uh, integers. Yeah, so we're just casting just here. So those were our numbers up there. And if we have a bit of a watch on ZMM1, we should see that we just selected, uh, what is it, round to nearest because of the RN just here, uh, using that little decoration. So we want, uh, what is it, signed integers. Okay, so here are the results of that little rounding just there. So 1.5 was rounded up to 2, 2.7 was rounded up to 3, uh, negative 2.7 was rounded down to negative 3, etc, etc, etc. So you can see that the rounding just there when we converted those floats to integers, the rounding was uh, round to nearest. It wasn't C++ regular truncation. Uh, as I understand it, this is not available in Intrinsics. If you want this uh, rounding control, then you have to do it in uh, assembly or machine code if you want, if you're really keen. <laughs> Uh, round to nearest, we've also got uh, round to zero, I think, uh, Z. Uh, round up and round down. Yeah. I think round to zero is truncation. Yeah, so if we just uh, have a bit of a look here again. So using truncation or round to zero, uh, 1.5 becomes one, no, 2.7 becomes two, negative 2.7 becomes negative two, uh, 1.9 becomes one. Yeah, so that's the regular uh, rounding that C++ would normally do. Well, they call it truncation. Yeah, but the other roundings that you can do is uh, round towards or round up, which is round towards positive infinity, or round down, which is uh, round towards negative infinity. Okay, so like I was saying, you've, you've always had uh, the ability to uh, set the rounding control uh, it's just that you used to have to go through MXCSR, and now this is so much more convenient. We can control the rounding control on a per instruction basis just by adding these uh, rounding control decorations. Interesting stuff. Let's move on. Uh, okay, compressed displacement. This is the final thing that we're going to talk about. Let me just write it here. Compressed displacement. We've had quite an adventure, but let's have a look at one more. Really interesting mechanism in AVX 512. Compressed displacement will be uh, largely up to the compiler or the assembler. And as a programmer, you don't tend to have to worry about this. But let's have a bit of a chat about what it is, just so that we're not confused when we see it in the literature. <laughs> the best way to understand what compressed displacement does is to write out one instruction that doesn't use it, one instruction that does, and then have a look at the machine code. So let's do that, shall we? Uh, v add uh, pd mm, whatever. Uh, okay, so I'm not actually gonna execute these instructions, so I don't really care what uh, RAM is pointing to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these two instructions kind of might look uh, pretty much the same. Uh, they, they pretty much are, but this top one just here is not going to use compressed displacement, and the bottom one is. So compressed displacement is a way to compress the displacement of an address. So just here, this final uh, operand just here, this is an address, or it's a pointer, in other words. RCX plus 123 bytes is where we're pointing to. And the displacement is the 123 just here. And down here, the displacement is 64 times five. I'll put a breakpoint there and we'll run. Uh, okay, so let's have a bit of a look at the disassembly so that we can understand what this compressed displacement business is all about. You'll see the first instruction just there is another three bytes wider. Yeah, this is some machine code just here. In memory, this instruction takes up another three bytes. And this second instruction, which looks almost the same, is three bytes shorter. This second instruction is using compressed displacement. What it means is that if the displacement just here, 64 times five, if that number is a multiple of the operand size, so the operands just here are 64 bytes, if the displacement is a multiple of the operand size, then compressed displacement will just store the five. Yeah, so that's what you see over here, uh, five as a byte. Whereas if the operand is not a multiple of the operand size, say this 123 just here, which is not a multiple of 64, the size of a, a ZMM register, then compressed displacement will not be used. 
and the displacement will be stored as a 32-bit integer, which is what we see there. Yeah, so it really is uh, literally, literally a way to store a displacement in a compressed way. The reason that they've done this is, uh, if I just write down a few things, so if, we, if we've got, say, four accumulators and we're dealing with the unrolled code, I'll just go, uh, I'll just make some pretend unrolled code just here. Um, okay, so that is an example just there of something that you might commonly see in unrolled code, an unrolled vectorized loop. So to get the most out of your CPU, you'll often see code like this. This is unrolled vector code. And what you'll see here, if we just get rid of this for a second, since um, 64 plus zero is just 64, you'll see that the access patterns of these accumulators is uh, all in little blocks of 64. Yeah, so that's really, really common. What AVX512 does is it grabs this uh, 64 by one, 64 by two, and 64 by three. And instead of using the entire 32-bit integer to store that as a normal displacement, it stores it as a compressed displacement. Yeah, so that's the idea of compressed displacement. It's just to make the storage of this uh, unrolled loop displacements uh, more convenient. Yeah, so that is uh, AVX512, or at least uh, some of it. Uh, we've really only scratched the surface. I mean, we haven't talked about the instructions themselves, and it's an iceberg, really. Some of these instructions are absolutely amazing. I mean, it's, uh, it's really just a, just a monstrous, marvelous and colorful instruction set. Anyway, I hope that was uh, mildly interesting to a few people, and uh, I just wanna say uh, thank you very much for watching. Yeah, I hope you have a really nice day. Um, cheers. So a couple of people have mentioned these pictures in the background. And uh, I just want to show a bit of a close up of them because I tell you what, I love them. I love them so much. Um, these are actually pictures drawn by my father. Yeah, so let's have a look. This one, I think he drew this in the, uh, in the 80s, maybe the early 80s, waiting at a train station in, uh, in Brisbane. I love the man's reflection in the window down there in the car. The cars look so cool too. Really cool picture. This is a koala playing cricket. Absolutely amazing, really. Absolutely amazing. Let's get a close up. Yeah, so he just gets a, a 6B lead pencil, Faber Castell. They're green. And uh, an eraser, a white piece of paper. Yeah, and he'll tell you that it's just patience. I mean, you ask him, how are you doing that? <laughs> And he says, it's just patience. It's just patience. Just such a cool guy. Such a cool guy. Anyway, if you're watching Dad, you're a bloody legend, mate. You're an absolute bloody legend.